Hello everyone, today's video is another video about MSM. Uh, lots of questions coming in about MSM, so I thought I'd try to rattle off a few answers here. Um, as per usual, nothing that I'm saying should be construed as medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. If you need medical advice, please talk to your healthcare provider to get that advice. So just for quick context, um, MSM, also known as methyl sulfonyl methane, um, it is something that can be used as a sulfur uh, supplement, essentially. If folks need more sulfur in their bodies, MSM is the most surefire way to get that in, to my understanding. And um, I had an interview with Dr. Kathleen Janelle on my podcast, the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast, and please cross-reference that if you want more information about that. I have several other videos other videos about MSM as well, a few other Q&A videos, and also um, just a few videos just talking about my experience with MSM, where it can be very helpful for folks dealing with chronic digestive issues, joint issues, uh, muscle issues, inflammatory issues, um, can help a lot with uh, issues with hair and skin, like uh, hair thinning, hair falling out, skin issues, uh, and uh, just overall support for the for connective tissue, amongst other things as well. So uh, it's, it's really quite an amazing substance because sulfur, to my understanding, is the fourth most common, uh, mo uh, fourth most prevalent mineral in the human body, or at least it should be. And so sometimes we need sulfur, um, just like we need magnesium and calcium and manganese and um, strontium and zinc and all the different minerals for various reasons. So without further ado, uh, here are the questions. Um, so one of the questions which I forgot to cut and paste into my little sheet that I have here to reference, um, it uh, was about what about other sources of sulfur? Um, so like what about glucosamine sulfate or um, shoot, there's one other one somebody was asking about too, and now I am blanking on it. Um, but are there other good sources of sulfur? Um, the, the long and short of it is that I've done the calculations on um, how much sulfur you can one can get from something like glucosamine sulfate, oh, chondroitin sulfate, that's the other one. Um, so um, from sulfate um, containing compounds. And if you look at the molecular size, uh, or if you look at the molecular structure, I should say, of MSM, it is very, very small. Um, it's basically a sulfur, um, atom. Um, it's got uh, uh, an oxygen atom. It's got some carbon, some hydrogen, and that's it. Like so, about thirty percent of the MSM molecule is sulfur. If you look at something like chondroitin sulfate or glucosamine sulfate, and there's one sulfur atom in this gigantic um, in this gigantic molecule. So it's just pennies on the dollar in terms of how much sulfur is in there. So yes, it's absolutely true and like a, a, a very um, poignant observation that the uh, other compounds do have sulfur in them, but just pound for pound, there's just so much sulfur in MSM, which is why it's such a good um, sulfur donating compound. The only other one that would really come close would be DMSO, um, and DMSO, uh, which is the exact same molecule, it just has one less um, uh, sulfur, uh, sorry, one less uh, oxygen atom um, in its molecular structure, um, it is, uh, it probably does work well and it does have anti-inflammatory uh, effects and things like that, but most people won't take it, at least not at high enough dosages because it makes you smell like onions or I find people that take it smell kind of like cream style corn, that's, the, that's what my nose tells me, some people say onions. Um, either way, it's not the most pleasant smell unless you really, really love onions and cream style corn, I suppose. But I, I love the smell of onions, you know, cooking on the stove, walk, come home, my wife's cooking onions. It's like, oh my gosh, just I'm in heaven. It's like, what are you cooking? It sounds delicious. Delicious. It, it's just onions, but they're so good. But it's not, it's not a good onion smell, in my opinion. So anyways, long and short of it is um, MSM is really uh, ir irreplaceable. And I, I kind of don't like saying that because I like there to be options. You know, should we ever have a time in the world where we don't have MSM for some reason, like nobody makes it anymore, I would be very sad because it's such a wonderful compound for so many patients, but there really is no direct uh, replacement. <clears throat> There's also magnesium sulfate as well, also known as Epsom salts, um, but taking those in high enough concentrations will give one a lot of diarrhea. So um, I that's not something I recommend for my patients. Okay, uh, next question here. Um, it says, uh, I began taking MSM at a low dose, only a quarter of a teaspoon, and gradually up to half a teaspoon, and held it at that for four weeks. I felt great. Um, I noticed that my ankle swelled slightly, and then uh, basically said they stopped taking it. They were still having ankle swelling for about a week afterwards, wondering is that a common side effect? Um, so not in my experience, no. I don't think I've seen ankle swelling or any swelling um, from MSM in my practice to date. Um, when I hear, a pa when a patient tells me that, and this is not my patient, so I'm not giving any medical advice, of course, as already mentioned, but if a patient of mine came in to see me and said, you know, I started taking X, Y, or Z supplement, I don't care what it is, but like X, Y, or Z supplement, and like I, I'm having ankle swelling from that, and I say, like, 
let's say it's a zinc supplement. It's like I've never seen zinc cause ankle swelling. And then you stop taking the zinc and now the swelling is still there. I'd be thinking like this might be unrelated. It might have been just a coincidence that the ankle swelling started. Now, granted, the zinc would be suspect, but it's just it's just never it just never causes that. You know, if somebody told me I started taking magnesium and I started getting diarrhea, it's like, you're taking too much magnesium. That's a well-known side effect. I started taking calcium, I got constipated. That's a well-known side effect of calcium. But um, to start taking calcium, I got ankle swelling. It's like, maybe it's not related to something else. Um, with that being said, MSM can trigger detoxification reactions, which is why I recommend to my patients that they build up the dose very, very gradually. And that could theoretically happen, but I, I would just be very odd to see that. So anyways, I have not seen it and it is not a common reaction in my experience or to my knowledge in general. Um, next question is, is it possible to get enough sulfur from food? So it's a really great question. And like we certainly get sulfur from food. It is the fourth most common mineral in the body to my understanding. And that just doesn't come out of thin air. So yes, we do ingest sulfur with our diets. But um, all I can tell you is that clinically folks who are eating lots of sulfurous foods, meat being the main source of sulfur in our diets to my understanding, but also like cruciferous vegetables like uh, Brussels sprouts and uh, broccoli and other stinky things. Onions are stinky, uh, cruciferous vegetables are stinky. It's a, it's a stinky convert, uh, you know, theme here with uh, some of these questions. Um, even folks that are eating plenty of those foods, they can still really benefit from MSM. Uh, I haven't done a kind of gram for gram comparison in terms of how much sulfur does a typical omnivorous diet or a carnivore diet bring into one's into one's body? But um, there, there is something about MSM and getting that extra sulfur that it seems to be very very helpful for folks. That being said, I have plenty of patients who don't have symptoms that suggest a sulfur deficiency, like their guts are healthy, their joints are healthy, um, their hair is healthy, their skin is healthy, their detox pathways are working well. So those folks are probably getting enough sulfur from their diet. Um, and um, and yeah, so I, I think that. Not not every so yes we can get enough sulfur from our food. Uh, we weren't all suffering from sulfur deficiency before MSM was invented, you know, thirty some odd years ago. But um, it, some people do seem to need more sulfur than what they're getting in their diets. Uh, the next one is says I have Hashimoto's and I take treatment. Uh, I take treatment for it. I think there's maybe a typo there. Um, I started MSM a couple of weeks ago, but I get strong headaches and also my throat is painful sometimes. Is it considered an intolerance? So um, I posted another Q&A video, I think earlier this week or last week, uh, recently, um, talking about sulfur intolerance, which is really more correctly referred to as sulfite intolerance. So, you know, I'm being maybe a little bit too literal here, but, you know, asking like, do those symptoms sound like a sulfur intolerance? And I would say, in my experience, no. Um, and I kind of rhyme off what sulfite intolerance symptoms look like in the other video. Um, but uh, those do, uh, if a patient of mine came in and said they were getting, you know, headaches and, you know, sore throat and things like that from taking MSM, I'd be thinking, well, that's not a side effect of MSM at all. Likelihood. It sounds like more of a detox related symptom. Um, so I, I would be thinking more along that line as opposed to like, oh, this patient is intolerant to sulfur. If somebody started taking MSM and they broke out in, you know, a rash, they got really itchy, um, it, you know, it was causing like what kind of looked like a histamine type reaction it could be a sulfur intolerant reaction. So that's how I would kind of differentiate that in my practice if one of my patients presented with that. A um, couple more here and then we'll then we'll be done the video. Uh, so uh, there was kind of a comment here. It's not that there wasn't a question, but I wanted to mention this. So uh, the person said, um, so on the background here, but they said, um, I can take one quarter teaspoon of MSM without having awful anxiety and a speedy brain. Um, when I take it, I can feel my liver, a dull pain, Castor oil packs help with that. Um, stools are loose and rusty brown. Bile beginning to move and detox. Um, and then they're kind of just issuing a, a warning here to folks who may have read the comments about make sure your biology is in the right place before adding something that can further bottleneck the detox pathways. Um, so it, it is a really, I appreciate the person mentioning this comment. And I just, reason I wanted to touch on this was that with MSM, I do feel like some of the effect of MSM, not all of it, but I think some of it may have to do with the bitter, bitter taste of MSM. Uh, it's very, very bitter tasting stuff. I mean, it's not insurmountably bitter. I take it every day and like it's, I've tasted some pretty bitter things in my day. It, it gives, you know, 
bitter tinctures and bitter herbs and things like that, like arugula, things like that. It gives it a run for them, a run for their money for sure. But it's not like you know, it's not like torture taking it down. In my in my opinion, I'm taking it for man probably a couple of years now, and yeah, just I don't know, just I still don't like the taste of it, but it's not that that bad. Uh, but it is quite bitter. Um, so when we taste bitter things, it does seem to have a reflexive effect on our livers and gallbladders, like our biliary flow, our stomach acid, our, our uh, pancreases, basically stimulating and kind of brewing up more of our digestive juices. Um, and so it is a really good point where if I had, say, a patient who had a lot of what we call like, you know, biliary congestion, congestion, like kind of like bile congestion or bile flow issues, or certainly if I knew that they had, you know, gallstones or things like that, or I was worried about like, I don't want to mobilize that too much because it could cause a stone to lodge in a smaller duct and cause, you know, gallbladder attack. Um, I, I would be really, in my practice, I would be very careful with that because of the bitter effect from MSM. And yeah, in terms of helping with that bile flow, I think it is an important thing to be aware of. So just kind of wanted to comment on that. And then the very last question here, kind of a funsy one, because I really like pharmacokinetics, is uh, how long does MSM stay in the body for? Um, and so to my understanding, MSM has a, so there are lots and lots of studies on MSM. And, you know, it's not like a, a household name, but um, they have done, despite the fact that it's not a household name, it, it is a supplement that's been around for a very long time. They've done a lot of animal studies on MSM. They've done human studies too, but a lot of animal studies, which means that they have looked at, you know, the, the distribution and the metabolism and different things like that with MSM. Um, and so my understanding is that MSM has a half-life of approximately um, 8 to 12 hours. Um, generally, when we're looking at half-lives, after going through about five half-lives, the substance in question is considered to be biologically inert at that point. So, um, you know, 8 to 12 times 5, so I guess 40 to 60 hours later, the MSM is considered basically totally out of the body. Um, but uh, yeah, about 8 to 12 hours. Um, it's very, very well absorbed. So it's absorbed, about like almost 100% of it is absorbed into the bloodstream. So it really kind of begs the question, is there really any point in doing intravenous MSM. I, I used to do IV MSM years and years and years ago, um, and there are some, there can be some good clinical benefits from that, but oral MSM really, really well absorbed, so do we really need to administer it um, intravenously? Maybe not. Um, and I, we don't use that anymore in my practice. I haven't for a long time. Um, so yeah, 8 to 12 hours, and it's primarily extruded through the kidneys, um, which is interesting because some patients do have detox symptoms um, in, in uh, like bladder or UTI or urinary tract related symptoms. I had one patient who unfortunately, um, she was uh, just having a heck of a time with the MSM. I really wanted her, her to take it for her bladder. And unfortunately it was just really aggravating her underlying interstitial cystitis. And so we decided to move on to something else. So didn't really see how that might've played out over time, but um, it's, yeah, anyways, just of, of note, it is passed primarily through the kidneys and uh, the bladder. Unless, of course, you take way too much too quickly and it has an osmotic laxative effect, in which case a lot of it would come out through the bowels. Um, if you wouldn't mind please taking a quick moment to like, share, subscribe, and or post a quick comment on the video, I'd really appreciate it. So thanks in advance for taking a second to do that. Um, if there are more questions about MSM, I will happily post another video about MSM. Um, I'll post videos about other things too, because this is not just an MSM channel, although it seems to quickly be turning into one. Um, but in all seriousness, happily post more questions, or post more, create more videos about MSM if there's interest, uh, if there's questions about anything else related to just general health, complex chronic illness, you know, whatever, all the stuff that I normally talk about, please feel free to post it in the comment section below, and I will do my best to answer as soon as I can.